We have realistic prospects for secession and decentralization. So, you know, milk toast stuff, like, you know, middle of the road stuff. Now, this is going to be fantastic. Ryan McMakin, Tho Bishop, Mike Meharry, and Jeff Deist. So, take it away, gentlemen. Thank you. Yes, this is the secession and decentralization portion of the program. Uh, and they're both bound up with each other. And we have, a, we have a large panel, so you each have about six minutes to, uh, to make your point uh, if, if I take a portion, which, so I'll, I'll just start with some introductory remarks and we'll just go right into the, into the panel. Um, now, Rothbard used a, a phrase, radical decentralization, and uh, he meant, yeah, he meant, yeah, decentralization, but not that wimpy version that you often hear about, usually when Republicans talk about federalism or something like that. So their notion of decentralization is, uh, for example, when the Republican AGs from Oklahoma and Nebraska sued the state of Colorado because they had legalized uh, marijuana in that state. And they said, well, we're for federalism. Yeah, other states, maybe they should be allowed to do what they want to do sometimes. But that's too much freedom. So it's too much laissez-faire in our neighboring states, so we're going to sue them because federalism demands it. And that's not, you know, that sort of thing when they, they, they act like that's decentralization. It's not. Rothbard's idea of radical decentralization is basically, it means uh, the phrase he used was universal rights locally enforced. So rights are universal, and they're the same everywhere. We all have natural rights, and we all have the same rights. But really, the only way that they can really be enforced is if there are polycentric centers of power and that laws are written, created, enforced, repealed in a variety of different places. And experience suggests that in reality, that is what's most conducive to freedom. And this isn't just some pure theory somewhere. This is a historical reality. Uh, historian Ralph Rako has done a lot of great work. Uh, he's not the only one on this topic, but showing that the reason Europe became an economic powerhouse, the reason people valued freedom in Europe, unlike other places in the world, was because Europe was so decentralized, that there was no Europe-wide empire, that Europe was a place of more than 1,500 independent entities and principalities and kingdoms uh, through its formative years, and that it was through that laboratory that the ideals of liberalism and freedom came out of Europe and nowhere else. And so any movement in the opposite direction moves us in the wrong direction. And it's not a coincidence, for example, that in the 16th century, the best place to be in the world for a regular person to achieve the highest standard of living and the most freedom was the Dutch Republic. Itself formed out of a secession movement from Spain and itself one of the most decentralized polities in the history of the world. Where, yeah, certainly the Kingdom of Orange wanted to dominate the rest of the country, but they didn't. And so you had paintings coming out of the Dutch Republic in that period, also known as the Golden Age of uh, the Dutch, where the painters were painting regular people. Because in a place like that, with heavy decentralization, with polycentric lawmaking, it was possible for regular people to exercise some power. So paintings there featured regular businessmen doing things, regular merchants doing their activities. And in other countries like France or Spain or to a lesser extent England, what were the paintings of? Right? Some worthless monarch doing his thing and leading a war. Um, you know, fat, effeminate bureaucrats, you know, eating, things like that. So there is a real difference, and decentralization reflects a greater thirst for freedom. And so we have examples. That came out of secession. The American Republic, of course, came out of secession. Uh, this isn't just something that uh, exists high uh, in, in theory somewhere in the ether. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But of course, decentralization and radical decentralization doesn't always have to mean totally independent entities. It can also mean a highly decentralized polity where all of the different areas have a high degree of independence and a high degree of an ability to make decisions for themselves, even if they are united on some issues like, say, geopolitics, military defense, 
that sort of thing. And you saw that to, a, for example, maybe historically a little bit in England, which other than the Netherlands was the other best place to live uh, for the last three or 400 years in the big picture. Uh, because it, even though it wasn't decentralized in the way the Dutch were, nevertheless had decentralized its power along a variety of different uh, centers of power, taking power away from the, the, specifically in the Civil War, from the Stuart monarchs who badly wanted to be absolutist monarchs, but failed at it, and you know, they chopped off uh, one of the king's heads because of it, and that actually paved the way for uh, some great things there. As Rothbard notes with the rise of the levelers uh, during the English Civil War, this was the first libertarian movement. This was a drive to really decentralize power at the national level. So that's very, very important. It's important that different groups have the ability to self-govern out of the reach of any sort of central government. And that fundamentally, state building, uh, this, this is a term that historians use, state building, building up powerful states, uh, the main process behind that often is in centralizing power in one place and literally bringing cities, provinces, wayward nobles into one umbrella and being able to rule them from the center. And so breaking down that process of state building is key to any sort of real uh, pursuit of freedom. So we'll talk a little bit here about uh, some practical methods of pursuing that really at the ground level. And uh, let's go ahead and start with Jeff and let Jeff kind of set this tone. So I think it depends on your <clears throat> definition of secession, first and foremost. I think there are hard and soft versions of secession, and I think soft elements of secession are happening all around us. I think they accelerated mightily under COVID in 2020. Uh, I re recall a couple of years ago, Hans Hermann Hoppe on a panel said, if you look at the nationalist movements of the 19th and uh, 20th centuries, they were mostly centralizing. In other words, uh, what used to be 50 these United States uh, uh, under Lincoln and then later Wilson and Roosevelt truly became just glorified federal counties. That was a centralist revolution. If you look at the patchwork quilt of Europe, especially countries like Germany, which consisted of, of uh, many, many pr provinces and cities, um, the you know, German nationalism, especially the nasty kind we think of in World War II, uh, well, World War I also, uh, well, those are centralizing impulses. But he says in the 21st century, most of the nationalist impulses are actually secessionist or breakaway in nature. In other words, Trump represented, at least in theory, a, a breakaway sentiment from DC. Brexit represented a breakaway sentiment from the EU. What's happening in Catalonia in Spain represents a breakaway uh, sentiment from Madrid. So I think these are all very happy circumstances and you know, 2020 was the year local reasserted itself, right? We've talked about this. It mattered a hell of a lot where you lived in 2020. If you lived in Australia, Australia, excuse me, Australia, you're basically in a penal colony. Uh, Canada shut down travel between the provinces. Uh, U.S. governors suggested doing the same. They kind of tried some checkpoints between U.S. states at the height of COVID. Remember that? And I recall watching the, the big riots after George Floyd spread to Los Angeles. And I was particularly interested because they were rioting in a part of, of the city, which is very near where David Gordon lives. Uh, Miracle Mile, sort of mid-century, if people know where that is. And there's a very famous deli he goes to every day, literally, Cantor's Deli. And uh, the rioters were at this sort of fancy mall right next door to it, and they were so upset about police brutality that they availed themselves of some Apple computers and some other items that would ease their pain. And I was watching this and I was looking at the police and they were these Terminator Robocops. They had these big military apparatus and they were dressed up as we've seen in Australia, as we've seen with these riots in Paris and other places which the media won't show us about, by the way, over COVID, that the police are in this riot gear where they almost look like something out of your kid's GI Joe or something. They look like soldiers, like Robocops. And I was thinking, wow, they're so removed from their own populace. Nobody in David's neighborhood knows who any of these people are. Now, compare and contrast that with where I live, a, a bucolic college town in Auburn, Alabama, about 75,000 people. Well, when COVID hit, 
Uh, the governor was trying to blow hot air about masks and shutdowns and distancing, and they created some uh, website with some new rules about what businesses could do. Well, at the Mises Institute, we're very fortunate to own our building. We're, we're not doing any of that. Uh, it, you know, it's private property. Uh, but what was interesting is where there was that sort of fog of war early on in COVID where we didn't quite know what authorities were going to do and how everything was going to shake out. There was some question about whether the local police in Auburn would be tasked with enforcing a mask requirement on stores, for example, public places. And the cops were like, no, no God, we don't want to do that. And the city council was like, we don't want to make them do that. And then the city council, cowards that they are, were relieved when the state governor came out with a mask thing, because then it wasn't something that they had legislated. But what was so interesting to me is we know the Auburn police. I mean, it's a small town. It's about college football and SEC life. And so a local cop might be someone you run into at the grocery. There certainly be a lot of people in town who go to that cop's church. Um, there would be a localized element if that cop started turning into one of those LA-style robocops, right? We would know that. So there might be some public opprobrium or a public pr pushback on that. So I thought that was a very interesting uh, thing to think about during COVID was that how all crises become local because all of a sudden it mattered very much, you know, what's your grocery got? What's your gas station have? What does your bank have? You got to have water and utilities and you got to have medical care and you might have to have uh, prescription drugs or whatever you need. And that stuff has to get to you on a truck or a train or however it gets. So this global world that we all thought we lived in, and you know, we, we, we do this all day, right? And I'm guilty of that. We, we tend to forget about the the corporeal world right around us. You know, who is the cop who's going to come if you have a problem? Who's the EMT? You know, who's going to mow that grass that's on the side of the freeway ramp that's starting to make your town look shabby? You know, at some point, the federal government can't do that. And if it can't do that, it sure as hell can't pay entitlements and remake Afghanistan, right? right. So I think there's some very happy trends coming. I want to talk a little bit more about those tonight. But I, I personally think secession, at least the soft kind, is not a pipe dream. All right, I'm going to start with the bad news. We live under the biggest, most powerful, arguably, government in the history of the world. This is a government, the federal government, that tells you how much water you can have in your toilet and what kind of light bulbs you can screw into your light fixtures. That's a pretty darn powerful government. Now, here's the good news. There is a way to undermine that massive centralized power. And I want to talk real quick about how we can do that practically. The first thing that I want you to do, this is my first piece of important advice. Never, ever call the 202 area code. Just don't do it. Those of you who aren't area code savvy, that's Washington, D.C. Now, my daughter lives in D.C. I'm allowed. The rest of you, don't ever call Washington, D.C. What I'm talking about really here is a shift in mindset. We tend to, as Americans, if we have any interest in politics at all, we tend to focus our attention on the presidential race and maybe a congressional race or our, our congressman. This is a complete waste of time if you care about liberty because these people don't care about liberty. It's like changing out the driver in a broken down car, right? If I have a car, it's up on blocks, wheels are falling off of it, there's no motor in it, I'm sitting in the driver's seat and I get out and my wife gets in the driver's seat, that car still ain't going nowhere. She looks a lot better than me, but the car's not going to go anywhere because the car itself is broken. And that's where we are. When we have a centralized government that's telling you how much water you can put in your toilet, you have a very, very big problem. And big is uh, intentionally being said there. And, and, you know, I see this tendency, though, even in libertarian circles. We get into this. You know, we think if we can just get the right president or the right guys in Congress, or maybe if we can get a good Supreme Court, then we can get liberty. Because we'll get a Supreme Court, and they'll, they'll impose liberty from on high. Well, first off, you don't impose liberty. That's not a thing. And, and the second thing is, again, these politically connected lawyers, they don't care about liberty. They're part of this centralized machine. You're asking part of the federal government to rein in the federal government. It doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't work, and we've seen it not work. Now, you may get a victory, but if some guy on a court says that you can have an AR-15, you've lost 
You might have won the battle, but you've lost the war because that same guy, you've given him the power to make that decision for you. So what we're talking about here is, as Ryan said, a radical decentralization. And I, I would be remiss being in a Mises thing if I didn't read a little bit of Rothbard. He said, in, in the U.S., it becomes important in moving towards such radical decentralization for libertarians and classical liberals, indeed for many other minority or dissident groups, to begin to lay the greatest stress on the forgotten Tenth Amendment and to try to decompose the role and power of the centralizing Supreme Court. Rather than trying to get people of one's own ideological persuasion on the Supreme Court, its power should be rolled back and minimized as far as possible, and its power decomposed into state or even local judicial bodies. So we're talking about this in a judicial sense, but I would say this applies to the executive, it applies to Congress. We need to focus our attention not on Washington, D.C., stop calling the 202 area code, and focus on state and local government. Well, you're saying, well, what's the state government going to do to the biggest, most powerful government in the history of the world? Well, I'm glad you asked, because this is the key, nullification. You've heard this word mentioned a few times uh, over the last, yesterday and today. Basically, it's just saying no. It's using local jurisdictions to undermine federal power. James Madison gave us this blueprint in Federalist 46 even before the Constitution was ratified. He said, if the federal government commits an unwarrantable act, unconstitutional, or even a warrantable act that just happens to be unpopular, he said the means of opposition are powerful and at hand. And he listed out some things he could do, and the most significant is a refusal to cooperate with officers of the union. Just say no to the feds. When they come along and say, we're going to enforce gun control, the state can say, no, we're not doing that. We've seen this work. Marijuana is the prime example. I have in my wallet a little card. I can go to a store here in Florida, and I can get weed. Ooh. The federal government says this is illegal, but this has moved to such a level at the state and local level that there is no way that the federal government can do anything about it. And here's the dirty little secret. The federal government depends on state and local actors to do virtually everything that they do. Without that state and local support, they can't do squat. They can't enforce COVID rules. They can't enforce gun control. They can't impose a medical system. They can't have the war on drugs. Heck, they can't even have the, the military industrial around the world empire building without the National Guard. So we have a powerful thing here that we can use, nullification. To learn more, go to 10th Amendment Center, all spelled out, dot com, and you will see how we're putting this strategy into practical effect. All right, well, hello, everyone. Um, you know, I have the great pleasure of uh, offering perhaps my most controversial opinion in circles like this. Uh, the last five years, I've become radicalized into becoming a Democrat, a, a lowercase d Democrat. Um, you know, I, I've become more Misesian with age. And it's because in the last five years, you know, we've seen uh, kind of two areas, really, where I think we've seen the greatest movements against the regime. You know, one is technological innovation, right? Bitcoin, encryption, 3D printing, all these are great. I have nothing to contribute to these fields outside of holding uh, Bitcoin and this sort of stuff. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad there's innovation on the entrepreneurship strategies that we've heard earlier. But on the Democratic side, you know, we've seen, obviously, Brexit, you know, one of the most radical you know, you know, political movements in, in Europe having success in quite a while. And then we've seen the Trumpening here. And I, I think the Trump moment in particular is something that libertarians must recognize is the greatest opportunity we've ever had. Because of Trump and the way that he exited the White House earlier this year, you, you had 50 plus million Americans that knew that the federal government is illegitimate. You, they, they recognize that Joe Biden is a president imposed upon them. And it's within this environment that we've seen the breakdown of legitimacy of the federal institutions of this country. Because of Trump, you have former Rick Santorum voters that want to abolish the FBI. Because of Trump, you have people losing faith in the conservative stacked Supreme Court because they wouldn't take up uh, election concern Supreme Court cases. Because of the woke aspects of the military, you have patriotic, decades-long service members that recognize that the leadership of the federal military hates them. You know, this is an opportunity for us to take advantage of. And when we look throughout history, you know, in America, populist movements, which are you know, democracy at its most finest, 
have been the greatest advantages that we've seen rolling back the federal state. Patrick Newman last night talked about how the Jacksonians are some of the heroes, and you're turning back some, not all, but some of the cronious aspects of early America. Well, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned there, because when the Jacksonian movement, you had the great icon, the great man, Andrew Jackson, but more importantly, you had Martin Van Buren, who was a great strategist behind the scenes, the master of Tammany Hall, and you also had intellectuals arming the Jacksonians with the arguments against the central bank. You had people like William Gouge. You had people uh, 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 like William Leggett. And what these are, they, these are all early American economic thinkers in the laissez-faire tradition, proto-Austrians, if you will. And so that, I think, is the model that if you know, we as libertarians, the, the mission of trying to create as many libertarians as possible is something that you know, the Mises Institute, you know, that's, that's one of the things we're trying to do, spreading the ideas. But in terms of political success, we don't need to make an America full of libertarians to pursue a strategy of decentralization. What instead, we need libertarians in positions of influence within the current political system. And if we look at the history of revolutions, often the revolutions start with massive opposition to the regime, recognizing that the standing regime no longer represents them, does not have their interests at heart. And again, I think we're seeing this play out with every single Let's Go Brandon chant at every college football stadium. <laughs> out there, people are waking up. Now, I, myself, in pursuing the strategy, I've gotten involved in my local Republican Party, um, you know, partly because it's a plus 43 Trump district, which means that Trump beat Biden by 43 points. And what's incredible is if you start talking to your normal average boomer Republican, they sound a lot like us, and they sound a lot more radical than your average capital L libertarian. You know, they recognize, again, that the government hates them. They, they are actively talking about secession, nullification. And in particular, again, like this issue with the election integrity aspect. You know, I was at an RPOF meeting of the Republican Party of the State of Florida, and the entire conversation was hijacked by a hour-long conversation about the necessity of secession or nullification if uh, Democrats in Congress patch HR1, which is kind of a nationalization of election law. And so I think what, you know, my suggestion has been to, to libertarians out there, if, if you're interested in pursuing an approach of, you know, working within your environment to create these forts against the regime, uh, working within a Republican party, if you're in a, a, a bright red area, provides you an institution which you can talk about ideas, which you're desperately looking for, particularly in this environment with, with the education battles that are going on, right? If, if you, one of the things that we did at our local parties, we bought a bunch of Tuttle Twins books. We do things with our local family, you know, with local people in the community dealing with students. We're doing outreach in the high schools on this sort of stuff. Uh, and of course, if you want to see an example of, you know, state power pushing back against this federal regime, I don't think there's a better example out there than Governor DeSantis here in the state of Florida. Uh, <laughs> And again, this is one of the things that has radicalized me, because I, you know, I, I remember back in the day thinking that there was no you know, great victories to be had in politics, particularly after the disappointments of 2012. Uh, but it's difficult to say that when, you when, I, when I've come to appreciate the fact that I've been freer than most people in this world the last two years, because a Team Red Republican, a Trump-endorsed guy, beat a Democrat by 33,000 votes. And so we, we need to be identifying leaders on the right that are willing to stand by that. And the great thing is you've had this rush towards liberty. Everyone wants to be Ron DeSantis out there in Republican politics right now. I don't care if that's blatant opportunism, which it is for most of these people. As long as their interests aligns with our interests, then I'm, I'm okay with working as many people as we can. Um, I think the opportunity we've had right now has never been better for our ideas. And again, the more that we can identify areas within our counties and our communities to focus on building these institutions up to push back against the, the regime as it stands, the better off we're going to be in any sort of strategy for decentralization. Thank you, Tho. And that's actually a perfect segue to my last two minutes worth of comments, which is it's really those people who you're talking about who are attempting to uh, crack the nut of one of the most important issues of decentralization. And I think that's really approaching the issue of military and geopolitics. I think there's, there's far too little discussion about what are the effects on geopolitics and military power in terms of decentralization and secession. <laughs> and uh, I think his name is Pat McGeehan in West Virginia. And some of these state legislators, and it's all state legislators of kind of the Trump variety, right, who are pushing legislation to finally regain some control at the state level uh, for U.S. Army forces and for the National Guard. Because the way the U.S. was designed is it was supposed to be a decentralized country, and the English had understood this in the Civil War as well, was, oh my goodness, somebody's calling me. Sorry. The, <laughs> yeah, I'll just be a second. The, 
and so the English understood if you want to maintain some freedom, you have to keep the king or the executive from controlling directly the military power. So the US was designed for the governors to have a final say on the deployment of their troops and the use of state troops, and that the standing army didn't really exist, that it was composed almost entirely of state militias that had been nationalized and called up. And so some state legislators are finally trying to return that power to the states, which had been gradually eroded after the Civil War and basically abolished in 1903 with the Knox Act, I believe. And then during the Cold War was finally completely destroyed when a bunch of anti-communist conservatives decided we can't let any state governors now impede the ability to send troops to Vietnam or some other foreign country to fight the executive wars, uh, executives wars forever. So that the power that states have on vetoing uh, total federal control of all military power has essentially been destroyed over the last hundred years, and it's only by really returning to some of that that you can start to do a, a functional return to uh, limiting the central states of pow power to really just simply um, invade if necessary and really exert uh, and turn the screws on local populations, American cities, if it ever comes to that sort of crisis situation. And so that's gonna be a key factor in obtaining any sort of real functional uh, decentralization. Now we do have time for a couple of questions maybe, because you guys were so efficient. Um, if I can go on that one point real quick. Sure. I, I think this is something that's gonna continue to escalate. We've already saw, uh, DeSantis for example, recalled uh, Florida Guard troops during the inauguration. Um, over this. And I, I think this in particular is going to be important because we're, what we're seeing right now, at least politically, I mean, obviously we have plenty of bases out there. We're still meddling far more than we do. But we're seeing a post-war war on terror moment now become a war on domestic terror. And, and those guns and those, all those weapons created and forged, you know, thanks to our friends in the Bush administration, are all being wielded. And it's no longer about the Middle East, it's about middle America. And, and so in that dynamic as well, I, I think you're, you're seeing that conflict with a lot of service members. This is not what they signed up for. Okay, all right, well then thank you very much.